Welcome to SciTech Biosciences Full Spectrum Profiling Educational Series on Panel Design Best Practices. In this video, we will apply the concepts discussed in the previous videos. As a reminder, video 1 discussed gathering information about the scientific question, populations of interest, and marker expression. The second video outlined the importance of understanding fluorochrome uniqueness and brightness while the third video covered the importance of understanding spread. These concepts are easy to apply when designing a low-parameter panel, such as a five-marker assay. Here, we will design a moderately complex 19-color panel to see these best practices in action. Let's prepare the information we will need as outlined in video one. Our scientific question is, are there differences in pro-inflammatory cytokines secreted by T cells and NK cells during COVID infection? From this information, we can determine that the panel will need to contain markers to define both T cell and NK cell subsets. We'll also need markers to identify their activation status. In this case, we'll include markers that indicate the ability of these cells to degranulate and produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. The tissue type for this project will be human peripheral blood mononuclear cells, otherwise known as PBMCs. We expect to have a good abundance of T and NK cells in this tissue, but in order to assess the cytokine production, we'll need to stimulate the cells in culture and block cytokine secretion. During the staining process, we will need to stain the surface antigens first and then permeabilize the cells to target the intracellular cytokines. Since the stimulation as well as the freezing and thawing process can induce cell death, we'll make sure to include a viability dye. This will allow us to avoid any false positives from antibodies binding non-specifically to dead cells. Keep in mind that we will need to use a fixable viability dye because our cell preparation protocol will contain steps to fix and permeabilize cells. Now let's take a closer look at our populations of interest to understand marker coexpression. We can make some assumptions regarding coexpression summarized here in our cell lineage tree. This diagram can help us understand coexpression between markers in the panel. T cells will be defined by CD3, which will be co-expressed with all other T cell markers. Our NK cells will be defined by CD56 expression. Because the NK cells will not express CD3, we don't have to worry about its co-expression with any NK exclusive markers. And the same is true for CD56 and the T cell exclusive markers. As we build this detailed lineage tree, we can continue to assess other markers in our panel. For example, we want to evaluate the activation markers TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and CD107A on each subset, so those markers will be co-expressed with all others in the panel. The next step is to classify the antigens we want to use in the panel, as discussed in Video 1. We identified a publication that has similar markers and a similar tissue type to our experiment, so we can see an example of CD127 staining. We'll classify this as tertiary and repeat this to identify the other tertiary markers in our panel. Here's another example, which we'll classify as secondary. We'll continue classifying the rest of the markers in the panel. Finally, for the last two markers, we can see the antigen expression pattern is clearly primary. It should be noted that the stimulation in this experimental setup will downregulate CD3 and CD4 expression. Since these will have differential antigen density as a result, they're classified as primary antigens in the unstimulated samples and tertiary antigens in the stimulated samples. The final piece of marker information to gather is antibody clones. When using any new clones, make sure to verify specificity. For this panel, many of the markers were validated in OMIP69 and OMIP1, so we'll choose clones from those publications. Now we can proceed to select fluorochromes, as covered in video two. 
we need to choose unique floors, and an easy place to start is to pick ones that are both excited by different lasers and have different emission maxima. In this example, we are starting with five floors using a five laser SciTech Aurora system. Our panel is 19 markers, so we can continue adding fluorochromes with unique peaks and signatures to minimize spread and complexity. While you may need to make adjustments to your fluorochrome selections as you pair them with markers, it's good to have a general plan for fluorophores beforehand and a chart of reagent availability. Now we're ready to design our panel. We'll start with the tertiary antigens because they usually have limited reagent availability and it's critical to pair them with very bright fluorochromes. If we select a fluorophore that is too dim, we will not be able to resolve the low density marker in both the single color controls and the multicolor samples. Remember that for this panel, we categorized CD3 and CD4 as tertiary markers in the stimulation condition. For any marker that has a range of antigen expression, be sure to select a fluorophore that will resolve the lowest level of expression. Based on this, we will assign CD3 and CD4 to bright or mid-bright floors. Moving to the secondary antigens, we need to factor in marker co-expression as we select any remaining bright or mid-bright floors. For secondary markers that are co-expressed with tertiary or other secondary markers, we should consult the stain index reduction, or SIR matrix. Let's look at this example of CCR7 on BV421. We can see that this placement will not impact the resolution of our five tertiary markers, so we will keep it here. Now we can assign the primary antigens. Recall in our previous video that fluorochrome brightness is one of the factors that impacts spread, so we can choose dim floors for these antigens to minimize this effect. As with the secondary antigens, we will consult the SIR matrix to verify our choices. Looking at CD45 on per CP, we see it has the potential to spread into TCRV delta 1 on per CP VIO700. However, as a primary marker, TCRV delta 1 is well separated from the negative population, and the SIR value of 50 is not too high. We will keep the selection because there's a high probability that TCRV delta 1 can still be resolved. Finally, we can assign the viability dye. In this case, we'll use live dead blue. As long as the viability dye is properly titrated, we won't need to worry about spread because we will be gating out any dead cells that stain positive for this dye. With all markers assigned to fluorochromes, we can proceed to a final theoretical panel QC. One method to do this is to use the panel matrix. In this tool, each column represents a fluorochrome's primary excitation laser, while the rows align with the fluorochrome's approximate emission maxima. Additionally, we have a bar representing the brightness of each floor. With this layout, we can see that most of the fluorophores are spread out, and we can focus our attention on anything in the same row or neighboring rows in the same column. It's likely that these areas have a higher potential for spread, and we can consult the SIR matrix to confirm. We can see that interferon gamma on PE, CD4 on C floor YG584, and CD3 on PE Dazzle594 have very close emission peaks off the yellow-green laser, so let's examine them in detail. Looking at the SIR matrix, we can see that PE may impact the resolution of C floor YG584 while PE Dazzle 594 might impact the resolution of PE and Seafloor YG584. We can also see that the SIR for BUV737 into BUV805 is relatively high. Recall that there are many factors that contribute to spread, so it is challenging to precisely predict if this combination will resolve all markers. It's up to us to decide if we want to change the panel to attempt to further minimize spread, or we can move forward with this panel and see how the data looks for the first iteration. To summarize, we have used all the best practices we have learned so far to design a theoretical panel. After gathering as much information as possible about our markers and fluorophores, we can assign the markers to floors, 
and then perform a theoretical panel QC using the panel and SIR matrix. The next video will cover the final stage of panel design, which is panel optimization. In this critical step, you will acquire data to determine if, in practice, the panel can resolve all populations of interest, or if adjustments to the floor selection, antibody titer, or staining protocol are needed. Visit SciTech's SpectralEarn educational portal to learn more on this and many other topics.